This is your life. <laughs> this is your home. So you have a really rough day at work. You're pretty anxious in your workplace, and then you come home, and thank God you're home. You're so happy to be there. It's your paradise. Walking through the backyard, you see like an old toilet that maybe you had three years ago that could be really useful one day. And maybe you see a whole bunch of newspapers that are out over the grass at your home. You go through the hallway and you see these big mountains of beautiful possessions that you've accumulated over such a long period of time, your collection. People see a mess, people see a threat to the security of the city. You see comfort personified, manifested. Every object has a story. Every object is an extension of your memories. Every object is you, externalized. So what is hoarding? Hoarding is defined as the compulsive and the excessive accumulation of things, or in some cases, animals. It may include things that others consider not worth keeping, which could be flyers from 50 years ago. It could be coupons that have long since expired, or unworn clothes that you will probably never wear. There could be parts of the home that become totally unusable, like a bed that you can't even sleep on or a kitchen table and a stove that are covered in various things. So then you eat from McDonald's every day to get by in your own home. It could also result in, in you or your family being at serious risks. There could be risks of fires. Maybe you come home and there's flooding out of your bathroom again because there's so many things in there that it's hard to, to get in there. And yes, there's black mold, but if you light incense, you won't smell it as much because it comes from the couch that's infested with the rats that you don't want to deal with because that couch belongs to your grandmother. And if you get rid of that, you lose that part of yourself. Why do people hoard? It could be a lot of different things. We know that there's a lot of evidence for a strong genetic factor. It runs in families, whether genetically and biologically or psychologically. We know that people with trauma or abuse in, that cause them to have a sense of a loss of control often develop this if they have those genetic predispositions. There could be cases where maybe you were pulled out of a home environment when you were very young and you were dropped somewhere else. And within that environment, some people turn to hyper-cleanliness to get by. And you turn to building a structure around you where you feel safe. It could be materialism within your culture that's telling you, it's Black Friday, it's Cyber Monday, you can be happy. <laughs> so fill up your house, right? Hoarding is pleasurable. We all know that. How many of us bought stuff this past weekend? It feels great for a little while. And it's painful to throw things out. I've got books from my high school years under my bed right now that I, I look at once every 10 years. <laughs> there could be cognitive challenges. We know that people with hoarding disorder often have trouble organizing themselves. They have trouble making priorities and, and following through those things. They're more likely to have ADHD. They have attentional problems very often. So even to make a plan to how they're gonna declutter is very difficult to focus on. And like we said, there can be this genetic component. If you talk to them, they'll tell you very good reasons for why they hoard. They don't do it because they have these strange delusions. They think they might need things in the future. Who of us doesn't think that? They have plans for the objects. They might never realize them, but you know, I've got these pins and needles here that if I ever can get some fabric, I'm gonna sew with these, though. They believe the objects represent opportunities that can't be passed up. Who of us doesn't wanna maximize their freedom? We're just like them. They're just like us. They don't want to waste things. We don't want to waste things. They're afraid of making the wrong decisions. Who isn't? That's all of us before we came to McGill, right? <laughs> 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 maybe while we're still here. <laughs> so feelings of safety, security, and control. These things, they're embodied in objects for them. They are not within themselves. They can look at their security. It's not within me, it's there. So if you want to get rid of that, you're going to come in as a social worker and tell me to get rid of my home base. You're going to take away my fortress. You're going to take away my security. You're going to erase my memories. Why should I listen to you? They want to keep people from visiting sometimes because they're so anxious about being around family members. They want to 
find their identity stabilized. I mean, our identities are fluctuating all the time. Our thoughts, our feelings, our memories. You're a different person one second ago than you are now. Don't you want to stabilize that? They do. They're just like us. In the DSM-4, there was no such thing as horny disorder. They thought it was a symptom of obsessive-compulsive personality disorder. There was no way to diagnose it, so they got no insurance benefits or coverage, so they couldn't go for therapy. <laughs> and if they did, they were blamed, because it's your fault you're hoarding, aren't you? Why are you so immoral? Why are you so dirty and unresponsible? There was practical meaning for that. No insurance coverage. Where are you going to go anyway? So they worked on that at DSM-5, and finally we have hoarding disorder. They realized it wasn't just a subset of OCD, it was its own thing. These are some of the criteria for hoarding disorder. Persistent difficulty discarding or parting with possessions, regardless of their actual value. This difficulty has to be due to a perceived need to save the items and to dis and the distress associated with getting rid of them. The difficulty discarding possessions results in accumulations that congest and clutter your active living area so you can't even live in your living room. If the living areas are uncluttered, it's only because your family came in and moved those things out maybe when you were in the hospital, which is extremely traumatic and is a horrible way to go, by the way, as an intervention. The hoarding causes clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other functioning. It's not attributable to another medical condition or to another mental disorder. It can't be simply due to OCD or maybe you're depressed so you don't have the energy to clean. That's not enough for hoarding disorder. Mm -hmm. And they have specifiers that can add, depending on the, the insight you have into your condition. So you can have dementia and also have hoarding disorder. In Canada, it affects 2-5% to 5 of the Canadian population, up to 1 to 1.8 million people. This is not all that uncommon, if you think about it. It's hard to work in a single Sapa department anywhere in Quebec and not see hoarders. Hoarding tendencies can be present in children and teenagers, but the parent controls your environment, so they'll clean it up for you. Now you're an adult, you're on your own, no parent there. It's a lot easier to build up your fortress. Much more common in female-identified people, we're not sure why, but it's the same thing with agoraphobia. The average agoraphobic is around a 50-year-old woman who was often widowed a few years before. But it also affects male-identified people and non-binary people as well. <laughs> The impact on the client is huge. They can experience shame, fear of letting others into their home. They can face real threats of eviction from landlords. Often, and often they go through a cycle. They'll clean it up when the person comes by. When they leave, they get it back as it was, and then a surprise visit will get them evicted. They experience social isolation. They face stigma, harsh judgment. They feel different and marginalized. They know that what they're doing is unusual. That's why they close their blinds. That's why they do everything in their power to not have you come over there. But they can't stop it. There's depression and anxiety, and they reinforce one another in a vicious cycle that keeps the hoarding going. You hoard to cope, and you cope by hoarding. It's rough on the family. This is very well documented in the research. People can burn out trying to convince the person to declutter, arguing over and over, not understanding that there's genetic factors and the the reasons people want to hold on to these flyers from 1925, they may cease visiting loved ones out of concerns for safety. They don't want to get bad bugs, and I mean, who, who among us does? We don't all have CLSC suits that you can wear and walk in to visit your uncle, right? And of course, there's policy debates about this. Who's to blame and who's responsible? That's what we're trying to figure out about every issue, right? Well, the neoliberals say, we know who's responsible, you, the hoarder. You're dirty, you're inept, you're incapable of keeping the clean home like every responsible person can do. I can do it, why can't you? I'm just a politician, but I can do it. <laughs> and, why, and why are you putting yourself and your family at risk? That's evil. You're, you're harming animals. You're cruel. Who should help the hoarder? They should help themselves. Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. You're a rugged individualist. Or are you? <laughs> The person is morally at fault, and maybe the family, maybe the family can help you, but if they don't, go be homeless, you know? Why should we have social programs for you? It's too expensive. Why spend money on people who don't deserve the help? Deserving poor, back to haunt us again. That's a matter of charity, that's not the government's responsibility. What's an alternative? How about an integrated perspective? 
we know that the client has a mental illness with biopsychosocial dimensions and causes. Why are we going to blame the client for everything when it's a person and environment issue? The family enables the person, the person enables themselves. We as society create the conditions that produce the problem in the first place. Aren't we all responsible then? Why is it all the person who has to do everything? But if the individual is not on board, the train can't leave the station. So, as we know in social work all the time, you've got a whole bunch of intervention ideas that are really great. But if the client doesn't want it, what are you going to do? There's local and community policies. Resources for hoarding are not available in all CSs in Montreal, even less so in rural and northern regions of Quebec, forget about it. Many mental health programs consider people with hoarding disorder ineligible because it's a personality disorder problem. We don't treat people with personality disorders. They're working off the DSM-4, they haven't even looked at the DSM-5. <laughs> Maybe quite qualified for having other issues, so unless you as the worker can say, oh, they have schizophrenia, they have depression, they have things you guys actually treat. Let's not even talk about the hoarding, let's just talk about that, and that's how we write our referrals, right? Sneak them in through their own eligibility criteria. Stigma of hoarding disorder is extremely common as the disorder is not well understood. We see this all the time. It was brutal to work in a CHSL day with a hoarder. She had no power whatsoever. They took all her stuff out of her room. They destroyed her things. What could she do? She was getting rats in the facility. She was a threat. So the hoarding is very powerful. And what about the beautiful Quebec and Canadian policy on hoarding? Which? There's no clear Quebec or Canadian policy at all. I looked through these documents and searched for the word hoarder or hoarding disorder. Not even a single mention in the plan d'action en santé mentale. Advancing the mental health strategy for Canada, framework for action. Why should we talk about hoarders? That's not a mental health issue. Uh, this it is. <laughs> <laughs> So what are we going to do, social workers? Micro level. Well, this is what we do every day at the CLSE. Advocate for services with the service providers who will often exclude the person by default, so you have to make the case. So again, play their game. If anxiety and depression and schizophrenia and adjustment disorder are covered, that's what you write in the referral. Advocate with the authorities. The courts want to make this a legal problem. Document your client's homes after each little step they make of an improvement. So you can bring those photos to court and prove that there's progress. Landlords want to evict, oh, they really do. No landlord wants a hoarder, and if they knew you were a hoarder, they wouldn't have let you in in the first place. So we need to use Educadwa to check the tenancy resources, check the laws, make sure what they're doing is legal. At the meso level, we have to advocate with and psychoeducate with the families, because they often don't understand what the person's going through. Explain the nature of the mental illness and correct the misconceptions. And here are some strategies we can use with families. Encourage them to support their loved ones to get help, but in a way that's like, how can I be helpful? Is there anything I can do to help? Let me know. Praise your loved one or just express gratitude for a small change. Thank you for doing that. Getting rid of that one newspaper, that really meant a lot to me. Acknowledge and validate the emotions behind the possessions. I, I see that this was really important to you. This was your high school life. You had this one toy back then. I don't know the toys. N64, maybe? <laughs> avoid shaming, embarrassing, lecturing, or telling the person what to do, and avoid covertly or overtly taking their stuff out of their house. So I'm just going to grab a bag. Just a bag. Well, they're going to see that bag because they know that whole clutter by heart. Advocate with the public. Support awareness campaigns and psychoeducation. Keep our eye on that site that has those laws that people are working on, right? And they're looking and those uh, public uh, committees where you can go and present. Here's what we see in the CLSC. What are we doing with, with that? Support the policy change. There's these standing committees, like I said. There's letter writing to the campaigns. Find out who makes the decisions. Find a way to that. What do we avoid with our clients? Well, we don't want to use words that negatively judge possessions. Why do you have all this junk? Yeah, that's probably not <laughs> person-centered care. So, use non-judgmental verbal expressions. I mean, they're, they're aware of frowns and grimaces. They, they can see what you're doing. They can, they can hear in your voice. The tonality expresses it. Try to persuade or argue with the person that doesn't work. You can't convince them to do this. You're going to build trust. You're going to create a foundation that may be something to happen. Touching the person's belongings without explicit permission. 
may be very intimate or distressing to them. You're touching their self. It's not an object. Arranging to clean up the place behind their back, bad idea. There's no overnight improvements. We have to go very slow and expect gradual changes. And even though the Oxy or the OEMC says you have to ask this question, if they don't want to answer that, we don't have to keep pushing it. Imagine ourselves in their shoes. How would we want to be treated if we were frustrated or anxious? We would want our feelings about objects validated. We would want our language used if we called things by possessions, not by joke. And we need to respect the fact that these possessions aren't junk anyway. Like we said, they're strongly attached to your sense of self. Highlight the strengths. Remain calm and factual. I mean, you don't go in and, and your first intervention is to start to declutter. It's not going to happen. Let's maybe see if we can make some room for the firefighter to get it. If there was a situation where you could be hurt. Or let's organize, so let's not get rid of anything. Then over time, you slowly start to see if they're open to something that could be like a CBT activity. Take a picture of something and then give the item away. Did you lose the memory? Did you lose that part of yourself? Or do you have the picture? You can still access it. And the cl these clients are very disconnected, so help them reconnect with nature, with animals, with people, with clubs, and online courses and volunteering. We can reframe thoughts, and you'll have these slides so you can see the examples. Make an empowerment plan for how you're going to break things down. Divide things into three categories, what to keep, what to discard, and what to give away. Start with discarding, recycling, or giving away the easy things, and gradually progress as you go. Celebrate the small steps forward, and by all means, remember that this is a human being. This is not some spectacle to laugh at at porters on TV. We are here to serve human beings. We are human beings, and I hope that I've shown you that porters are a lot like us. Thank you.